everyone. Welcome again. Um, I hope you've been having a lovely day today. We're so excited to have you here uh, for this wonderful celebration of the poetry and poetic life of Denise Levertov, and more specifically right now for Mary Gordon's talk on Levertov's work. Before we start, I just wanted to thank Loyola's Gannon Center for Women in Leadership, which has generously <laughs> provided funding for this event. The Gannon Center educates and fosters women leaders to contribute in the development of a more just social order. Its mission is to prepare women to lead in every sector of society, promote innovative, innovative uh, interdisciplinary research that will shape leadership in the 21st century, and advance dialogue on compelling issues affecting women's lives. Thank you in particular to Janet Sisler, uh, director of the Gannon Center, for her leadership and support of this event. Just a few words of introduction for our featured speaker. Mary Gordon was born in New York and raised in a strict Catholic religious environment by her Catholic mother and her Jewish father who converted to Catholicism. In many of her works, she explores contemporary American Catholic life. Through her novels, short stories, essays, and memoirs, she weaves a textured and vibrant narrative fabric from the intricacy and entanglement of faith, morals, politics, and cultural heritage. She attended Barnard College and published her first novel, Final Payments, in 1979 to much critical acclaim, followed a year later by a second novel, The Company of Women. Both books explore the lives of young Catholic women who face difficulties as they find their way in a secular world. These two works were followed by other novels, including Men and Angels, The Other Side, Spending, and Pearl. Gordon is also the author of a book of short stories titled Temporary Shelter, two essay collections, Good Boys and Dead Girls, and Seeing Through Places. Her biography of Joan of Arc garnered her the O.B. Hardison Award from the Massachusetts Center for Renaissance Studies. She has also written two memoirs, The Shadow Man, Examining Her Father's Mysterious and Complicated Life, as well as Circling My Mother, a bittersweet memoir about their relationship. Her most recent books include the nonfiction work Reading Jesus, A Writer's Encounter with the Gospels, published in 2009, the 2011 novel The Love of My Youth, about first lovers meeting and reliving their past after 30 years, and lastly and most recently, The Liar's Wife, a collection of four novellas published in 2014. She's received the Reader's Digest Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and is a three-time recipient of the O. Henry Award for Best Short Story. She currently teaches literature and writing at Barnard College, where she is the Millicent McIntosh Professor of English. Her talk this evening is titled, Denise Levertov, The Uses of Outrage. Please help me welcome Mary Gordon. I just said to Mark, I think this is probably the best conference I've ever been to in my life. It's a wonderful mix of, of passion and erudition, uh, of care and engagement that most conferences are not. So um, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit humbled uh, to be here at the, at this hour, and um, I'm doing something a little bit a little bit different. Nobody likes an angry woman. I looked in the thesaurus for words especially invented for the category. I found Harridan, Shrew, Virago, Harpy, Ptarmigant, Fishwife, the ever popular Bitch, and Ballbuster, suggesting that a woman's anger is dangerous to a man's health. <laughs> the same thesaurus offers words crank, tartar, dragon, churl that are applicable to both men and women, but not a single word that could apply to men only. 
Yet some of us feel that simply because of the accident of having been born female, we have a special license to anger, well earned and sometimes even underused. Does anger have a good side? I'm thinking of a conversation I had with two friends, both women, one a Benedictine sister active in interfaith initiatives and social justice programs, one a Buddhist. The Buddhists said that in Buddhism, anger is always a bad thing, that a moment of anger can undo a lifetime of good practice. The Benedictine sister said, I don't know, if I didn't get angry, I might never get off my butt. <laughs> and so there is anger and anger. There is the anger that happens when someone takes your parking spot or cuts in front of you on a supermarket line, or when your beloved, having been told a thousand times that you cannot do this, mixes white and colored clothes in a hot wash, turning all your underwear a sickly mauve. <laughs> and then there is the anger that is more properly perhaps called outrage, a response to something wrong with the world, a witness, an impassioned response. From reading the two excellent biographies of Denise Levertov, I imagine that she was capable of both kinds of anger, but today I would like to focus on the second kind, her outrage, its flavors, and its causes, and its relationship to her life and art. I see her outrage as deriving from different sources, from the one who hungers and thirsts after justice and cries out at the suffering of the world. And then there is the angry poet. But there is another kind of outrage which I would call repressed or avoided outrage, her outrage as a woman. Not only the outrages itself, but their resolutions in her life and work configure themselves differently and resolve themselves both in the life and in the work with varying degrees of completeness and integration. Let's begin with the political first, as Levertov's identity as a political and po poet has been so important and sometimes detrimental to her reputation and the larger understanding of her work. From the mid-60s on, the horror of the Vietnam War took over her political, political poetic life and opened a new chapter of political activism for her. But it's always a mistake to divide Levertov's life into neat periods, because an earlier poem during the Eichmann trial was published in the early 60s, and it points the way to a political endeavor. Levertov insists not only the, on the possibility, but the necessity of combining political passion and outrage with the highest aesthetic standards. She articulates this in two essays from this period, The Poet in the World and Poetry as Prophecy and Survival. She says, a poetry of anguish, anguish, a poetry of anger, of rage, a poetry that from literal or deeply imagined experience depicts and denounces perennial injustices and cruelty in their current forms, and in our particular time warns of the unprecedented perils that confront us, can truly be a high poetry, as well wrought as any other. For Levertov, the poet's work does not include, but necessitates action. She says, morality at certain points in history, of which I believe this is one, this year, even if not this day, demands of us that we sometimes leave our desks, our classrooms, our libraries, and manifest in the streets and by radical political actions that love of the good and the beautiful, that love of life and its arts to which otherwise we pay only lip service. I take the words that we must leave our desks, our classrooms, and our libraries metaphorically because sometimes I see Levertov deliberately making choices against well-wrought and highly crafted language, which might be less accessible, in favor of immediate 
and more agitprop language, which marks the exigencies of the political moment. It is almost, in some ways, a self-sacrificial act. Levertov was severely and roundly criticized for the political content of her poetry. Former admirers, most noteworthy Robert Duncan, accused her of abandoning her aesthetic standards for propaganda. Certainly, she is capable sometimes of unnuanced language, particularly as her despair at the conduct of the war grew more acute, as she gave up her principles of nonviolent protest, and as her and Mitchell Goodman's increased activism led to his arrest, trial, and imprisonment. The title of her poem, Goodbye to Tolerance, clearly indicates <clears throat> this. Genial poets, pink-faced, earnest wits, you have given the world some choice morsels, gobbets of language presented as one presents T-bone steak and cherries jubilee. Goodbye, goodbye. I don't care if I never taste your fine food again. Neutral fellows, seers of every side, tolerance, what crimes are committed in your name? And you good women, bakers of nicest bread, blood donors, your crumbs choke me. I would not want a drop of your blood in me. It is pumped by weak hearts. This accusation is repeated in two sections of Staying Alive, remarkable sections in which she accuses people of sympathizing with Mitchell Goodman's predicament in the trial of being wrong-headed in uh, not focusing on the suffering in Vietnam. One of these accusations is in the form of a nursery rhyme and one is in prose. The sympathy of mild good folk a kind of latex from their leaves. Our inconvenience draws it out, the white of egg without the yolk. It soothes their conscience and relieves the irritations of their doubt. I can only feel sorry for people who might, in all good faith, have said, I'm sorry for the problems that you're going through, to have been addressed in this way. You see how it is. I am angry that they feel no outrage. Their feeling flows in the wrong directions and at the wrong intensity. And all I can bring forth out of my anger is a few flippant rhymes. What I want to tell you, no, not you, you understand it. I want them to grasp is that though I understand that Mitch may have to go to jail and that it will be a hard time for him and for me, yet because it's for doing what we know we must do that hardship is imaginable, even passable, and a small thing in the face of the slaughter of Vietnam and the other slaughter that will come, and there's no certainty he'll go to jail. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> the assertion that her political poem poetry is inferior is, I believe, unfair. Levertov wrote a lot of political poetry. She wrote a lot of poetry. Some of the poems are weak, earning the criticisms of her detractors, but some of them are triumphant explorations of form and content that draw upon her great gifts of image and music making. In the poem Life at War, I find examples of both Levertov's strong and weak writing. The poem contains subtle and evocative passages and thumping lines of undigested revulsion. The incantatory lines, delicate man whose flesh responds to a caress, whose eyes are flowers that perceive the stars, whose music excels the music of birds, whose laughter matches the laughter of dogs, whose understanding manifests designs fairer than the spider's most intricate web. These beautiful incantatory lines, and again, we can, he we can see the foreshadowing of later liturgical language. These are followed immediately by far cruder and less effective, the scheduled breaking open of breasts whose milk runs out of the entrails of still alive babies, transformation of witnessing eyes to pulp fragments, implosion of skin penises into carcass gullies. You can sort of imagine why Robert Duncan moved back from lines such as these. 
it's interesting to me, to me that in two of her political poems that are to my mind the most fully realized point to Levertov's late work in which the religious content is fully articulated. These earlier uses having a formal rather than existential connection to Levertov's life. I am thinking of autumn 19, 1966 and Tenebrae. This is Adam, Advent, did I say autumn? I meant Advent 1966. Because in Vietnam the vision of a burning babe is multiplied, multiplied, the flesh on fire, not Christ's as Suttle saw it, prefiguring the passion upon the eve of Christmas, but wholly human and repeated, repeated, infant after infant, their names forgotten, their sex unknown to the ashes, set alight, flaming but not vanishing, not vanishing as his vision but lingering, cinders upon the earth or living on, moaning and stinking in hospitals three abed. Because of this, my strong sight, my clear caressive sight, my poet's sight, I was given that it might stir me to song is blurred. There is a cataract filming over my inner eyes or else a monstrous insect has entered my set head and looks out from my sockets with multiple vision, seeing not the unique holy infant burning sublimely, an imagination of redemption, furnish in which souls are wrought into new life, but as if off a belt line, more and more senseless figures of flame. And this insect who is not there, it is my own eyes who do the seeing, the insect is not there, what I see is there will not permit me to look elsewhere, or if I look, to see, except dulled and unfocused, the delicate, firm, whole flesh of the still unburned. I think it will be very interesting to think about that poem in relation to later poems in which the distinction between uh, what is actually happening and final transcendent meaning are, are are brought together, but again we can hear the form of the litany being repeated, the form of the incantation, uh, those religious notes which are never separate, I think, from, from anything that she writes. Like Ad Advent 1966, the title Tenebrae is also taken from religious vocabulary. Tenebrae is a service performed during Holy Week at dusk or dawn, and Julia, this I think fits in nicely with what you said. At dusk or dawn, usually on Holy Thursday, it's marked by the gradual extinguishing of lights. The rhythms of liturgical repetition are invoked here in the syntactic repetition and the buying and selling buzzes in our heads and weddings are held in full solemnity and picnic parties return from the beaches and at the, their ears, the sounding of war. Each of these syntactically repetitive lines is opened up by what follows, and the buying and selling buzzes at our heads, a swarm of busy flies, a kind of innocence. Not only the syntax, but the actual word innocence is repeated in the next stanza but one, and weddings are head in, held in full solemnity, not of desire, but of etiquette, the nuptial pomp of starched lace, a grim innocence. Repeated to is the lament. They are not listening, not listening. As Levertov moved from a political consciousness that was largely agnostic, as in Advent 1966 and Tenebrae, to a more articulated, more formal, and eventually institutionally embedded religious life. Her political commitments did not lessen, but the rage or outrage changes in tone. The tone becomes more resigned, the questions of human injustice blending in with questions about the problem of evil and suffering in the context of a loving God. Questions of private suffering take their place beside those of large-scale public horrors and the destruction of the planet. We see this in During a Son's Dangerous Illness and in St. Thomas Didius. 
St. Thomas Didymus, during which the father of an afflicted child cured by Jesus asks, why has this child lost his childhood in suffering? Why is he cruelly punished who has done nothing except be born? In this poem, the accusation of injustice is leveled against God, and the accusing question is answered not through logical argument, but through the encounter with the wounded flesh of Jesus, resulting in the understanding, my question not answered, but given its part in a vast unfolding design lit by a rising sun. This poem is absolutely important to me because it is the only satisfactory answer I have ever encountered in the question that makes me want to jump the religious ship. How can we explain a loving God in relation to the suffering of innocent children? There is no explanation. There is only touch. In the late religious poems, then, the outraged questioning about injustice which causes human suffering is not answered, but given over to a truth beyond language, as in suspended, or in whom we move and breathe and have our being, or particularly primary wonder, which contemplates the mystery, quote, that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything, rather than void, and that, O oh love creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it. <clears throat> if Levertov was capable of political outrage, she was also capable of aesthetic outrage as a poet who revered disciplined craft. She had no time for sloppy prosody, and although she was sympathetic to Allen Ginsberg as a poet and she admired his Kaddish, she found his and the Beats' work excessively loose and therefore unsatisfactory. In her essay on the need for new terms, she says, quote, my passion is for the vertebrate and cohesive in all art. <laughs> I believe that any distinction between form and that which lacks form can only be a distinction of art from non-art, not from kinds of art. She had no time for confessional poetry, finding it indecorous, lacking the reticence that to her was a form of tact. In Lighting Up the Cave, her essay on Anne Sexton, she says, quote, alienation is of ethical value, is life affirmative and conducive to creativity only when it is accompanied by a political consciousness that imagines and affirms and works toward an alternative to the society from which it turns away in disgust. Lacking this, the alienated person, if he or she is gifted, becomes especially a prey to the exploitation that characterizes capitalism and is its underlying principle. The manifestations in words, music, paint, or what have you of private anguish are exploited by a greedy public, a public greedy for emotion at second hand because starved of the experience of community. Concurrently, for the same reasons, a creative person, whether a pop star or a Sylvia Plath or a John Berriman or an Ann Sexton, internalizes the exploitive, unwillingly becoming self-exploited. Uh, it's a remarkably unsympathetic response to private mental anguish. But Levertov was equally critical of poetry that lacked human feeling and accessible content. She had a public hissy fit on the subject of language poetry. She said, it is wrong to take the language to oneself as private property, for it is part of the very nature of human beings to have communion with one another, and the deliberate violation of traditional syntax in making that difficult is arrogant and pernicious. When the critic Marjorie Perloff challenged her, counting herself among the small group of people for whom breaking the rules of syntax does commune, and asking Levertov, is that a false communion? Levertov res 
responded that she doubted that that could really happen and that her love was being merely fanciful. <laughs> she disagreed with Philip Larkin's assertion that there was no connection between form and content, finally rejecting Pound despite her early attraction for him because of his anti-Semitism and fascism. When he had been invited to be on a, in a symposium in which she was going to participate, she wrote angrily to her publisher and dear friend James Laughlin, quote, he should be preserved in alcohol for a museum. Who invited him? <laughs> Consistent throughout her poetic life was the insistence that poetry must be embodied, that it must not exclude the lived life, the life of politics, the life of the body. The interaction of life and art and of art on life is continuous, she says. Poetry is necessary to a whole man and that poetry be not divided from the rest of life is necessary to it. Both life and poetry fade, wilt, shrink when they are divorced. And in her words, a poetry of anger or rage is not sufficient in itself. She says, it has the obvious function of raising consciousness and articulating emotions for people who have not the gift of expression. But we also need the poetry of praise, of love for the world, the vision of the potential for good, even in our species, which has so messed up the rest of creation, so found it, fouled its own nest. If we lose this sense of contrast, of the opposites to all the grime and gore, <clears throat> the torture, the banality of the computerized apocalypse, we lose the reason for trying to work for redemptive change. She goes on. We also need the poetry of praise, of love for the world, the vision of the potential for good, even in our species. If we lose the sense of contrast, we lose everything. Perhaps the most clear and consistent marker of Levertov's vision is its insistence upon inclusiveness, the admixture of horror and awe, of sorrow and ecstasy. In poetry, Prophecy and Survival, she says, a poetry articulating the dreads and horrors of our time is necessary in order to make readers understand what is happening, really understand it, and not just know about it, but feel it. And a poetry of praise is equally necessary that we not become overcome by despair, but have the constant incentive of envisioned positive possibility. And because praise is an irresistible impulse of the soul, but again, that profound impulse, the radiant joy, the awe of gratitude is trivialized if its manifestations do not in some way acknowledge the content of icy shadows. Once again, no duality, no separation inclusion of opposites, of paradox, of irony. As she became more involved in a formal religious life, this conviction transformed itself into the idea of poetry as her vocation, as her way of placing the spiritual into the world through the medium of exact, attentive language. In the late poem, The Life of Art, she expresses her understanding of the poet's work, her work, in this world and beyond. There is no adversary to be fought against here, no Sexton, no Berriman, no Marjorie per Perloff. The partner in her dialogue is God, whom Levertov saw as the supreme artist. The life of art. The borderland. That's where, if one knew how, one would establish residence. That watershed, that spine, that looking glass. I mean the edge between impasto service, burnt sienna, thick, striate, gleaming, swaths and windows of carnal paint or canvas barely stained where warp and weft peer through. And fictive truth, a room, a vase, an open door giving upon the clouds. A step back and you have the likeness, its own world. Step to the wall again and you're so near the paint you could lick it. 
You breathe in its ghostly turpentine, but there's an interface, immeasurable, elusive, an equilibrium just attainable sometimes when the attention's rightly poised, when you are opulently received by the bravura gestures, hand and brush proffer, as if a courtier twirled a feathered velvet hat to bow you in. And yet, without losing sight of one stroke, one scrape of the knife, you are drawn through into that room, into its air and temperature. Couldn't one learn to maintain that exquisite balance more than a second? One sees even the penciled understrokes and shivers in pleasure, and one's finger tips, tips touch the carpet's nubs of wool, the cold fruit in a bowl. One almost sees what lies beyond the window, beyond the frame, beyond. And note that the word beyond is the last word in a poem called The Life of Art. For Levitov, above all, the poet must have the necessary twin disciplines of attention and perseverance, or vision will go to waste. In For Whom the God Loves Less, she invokes the example of the great perseverers, Rilke, Cezanne, James, and urges herself when she's discouraged by what she sees as repetitions of her earlier work. Remembrance dismays you, and then look. Some inflection of light, some wing of shadow is other, unvoiced. You can, you must proceed. Almost a Victorian word, proceed. Maybe it came from her mother. <laughs> Now we come to the problematic and potentially unpopular part of this talk, Levertov as a woman. I preface everything I'm about to say with my anxieties about its potential objective worth. This is because of my strong personal identification with Levertov, which of course can lead directly to unfounded projection. Perhaps my identification with her begins with a similarity in our forebears. Both our fathers were converts from Judaism. Both, although in vastly different ways, deeply religious Christians. My father a Catholic, hers an Anglican. Both our mothers, deeply spiritual woman. Her mother Welsh, my mother Irish and Sicilian. This sense of being a mongrel has tied me imaginatively to Levertov. You can imagine how my heart leapt when I read her describing herself as a Jew among Christians, a Goy among Jews, a Celt among Anglo-Saxons, a Russian among Celts. I share a remarkable number of aesthetic loves or obsessions with her. Like Levertov, I keep a copy of Catherine Mansfield's journals on my desk. I worship Rilke and Hopkins. I love hog funerary objects. <clears throat> I pers persist in a devotion against all common sense to the progressive wing of the Catholic Church. And I say daily prayers to Oscar Romero. And so, of course, it's a disappointment to me to have to confront Levertov's rejection of feminism and her shocking homophobia. I'm saddened by it for myself, because always her guidance is invaluable to me, and for her, because I think she denied herself important richnesses and consolations. Although I regret Levertov's failure to embrace feminism, I think I can understand some of its roots. Some of these are aesthetic. Much of the poetry that characterized the feminism of the 70s and 80s would have struck her as self-indulgent, as most confessional poetry did, and unformed, echoing her dislike of beat poetry. When I was a newly published writer, I cringed at the thought of being bracketed with writers whom I considered crude and embarrassingly unformed just because we are all women. As a matter of fact, I owe my marriage to just such reservations. My first conversation with my husband was about Erica Jong's fear of flying. <laughs> he told me he had read it and enjoyed it. I said, I simply can't believe that. I think you only say that because you think it's a good way of picking up women. <laughs> he laughed and said I was right. 
reader, I married him. <laughs> but I find Levertov's statements of her refusal to name herself a poet on aesthetic grounds unconvincing in light of her assertions that the lived life must place itself in the poetry and the decisions she made about content over form when she was writing political poems. Even the language of her essay on gender and genre is flatter and duller than her usual impassioned assertions, which even when they are crabby, are usually lively. She says, the content of a poem often reveals, or is naturally assumed to reveal, the sex of, the sex of its author. Genre is determined by subject matter, and subject matter may on occasion emerge from experiences that are specifically male or female, but not more frequently than that from which factors as predominantly urban or predominantly rural life, from poverty or riches, from particular political convictions, or from individual temperamental or physical idiosyncrasies. Clearly, many historical facts have affected what, how much, and how women write in various times and places. But none of these is essentially a matter of aesthetics. If in a particular period a woman is timid about her diction for fear of incurring hostility by using rough, harsh, or rude words, she is making a social and psychological condition, decision rather than an aesthetic one. A true artist of either sex must necessarily be in relation to the art he or she serves, even if shy and afraid about other things, a person of courage and energy who will not succumb to that kind of cultural pleasure. Does she really think that shyness is the correct term for what has held women back from free expression? Shyness? Really, Denise? So some of what I imagine are her reasons for rejecting feminism only make me sad and yet disappointed. But one of them makes me downright angry, and that is her homophobia, which in a late examination of conscience she confessed. Though she referred to it as a secret homophobia, I'd like to tell her, Denise, it wasn't such a big secret. <laughs> and it was directed much more to lesbians than to gay men. Her success as a poet came to her unusually for a woman because she had garnered the approval and acceptance and affection of powerful men. That she was the exception rather than the rule seemed a kind of privilege she was unwilling to acknowledge and perhaps unwilling to relinquish. She seemed unable as well to relinquish the need in her words to be, quote, adored by men, unquote. She was trapped in a sense of failure in terms of the most traditional sort. This courageous poet and witness who was able to see through so many dead ideas was capable late in life of saying, quote, I can't help feeling that people will think there's something wrong with me that I can't find a man, will pity me. Then my own appearance, every sign of aging, especially in my face, is depressing to me and emphasizes my own isolation. The depression of the encounter of one's own aging face in the mirror is, of course, entirely comprehensible. Who of us over the age of 40 hasn't experienced it? But what is surprising in Levertov's words is her sense that people will think less of her, that there's something wrong with her, this poet, this hero of resistance, because she can't, quote, unquote, find a man. Levertov's anguish at feeling undesirable and unloved point to the uniqueness of feminism as a political movement. It is the charge center in which the personal and the political inevitably intersect. If you are a heterosexual woman who wants to have a physical relation with a man, you can always be accused by yourself or others of sleeping with the enemy. Some separatist feminists accused us of just that. It is easy to name an enemy or an adversary if the subject is war or poverty or aesthetic form. 
Easier to set oneself clearly against Kissinger or Johnson or Reagan or Marjorie Perloff or John Berryman or Anne Sexton or Ezra Pound than against a nameless category of half the human race, leaderless phallic symbols whose approval, acceptance, and love you nevertheless desire. Naming men or a man as the enemy was exactly what Lavrov would not do. And she rejected feminists, particularly lesbian feminists, for just this reason. And there was no communal or public situation to the problem of loneliness because one has not had the good luck of finding a man to whom you will be the most, the only important one. And this was a cause of great sorrow for her. But here I come back to the title of my talk, The Uses of Outrage. My idea is that Levertov held herself back from greater happiness and fulfillment because she accepted too readily the conditions of a sexist world without impulse to resist, without the fuel of anger that would help her to name properly the causes of her sorrow and the sorrows of those whom she was reluctant to call her sisters. The late poems that deal with the subject of women are perhaps too even-handed, too free of what she called the icy shadows. She and the muse playfully begins with away he goes, the hour's delightful hero, and ends with the equally playful, she picks a quill, dips it, begins to write, but not of him. In prayer for revolutionary love, she seems to place responsibility for change and blame equally in the hands of men and women, something she would never do if her subject were race or the unequal distribution of wealth. In the women, the two lives, the one in homespun, the one in crazy feathers, have their flesh pierced. But it is not clear whether it is by themselves that the flesh is being pierced or by the bridegroom who may not, quote, be able to endure life with two brides. Of course, I understand the irony of the question. But she would never have used such a jocular tone when considering other injustices, such as racism. What happened to the pissed off young woman who wrote Hypocrite Women? Or to the furious little girl who broke with her only friend because the other girl considered wading barefoot in a stream unladylike? <coughs> Like everything else in her life, Levertov's sense of herself as a woman worked itself into her poetry. But borrowing my friend the Benedictine sister's idea, the idea that anger is the fuel that gets us off our butts, one hopes to a better place, I wonder if Levertov didn't give her anger at the fate of woman sufficient time and place to fuel a more integrated self-understanding. After Hypocrite Women, it would be difficult to find a poem of hers that has anything like outrage at the fate of women. Did she not feel at least some sense of resentment at the fact that when she expressed sexual desire for younger men, they so often told her that they loved her for her mind? An older woman being understood to be undesirable, whereas her husband got to marry a 22-year-old and start a new family with her? The tone of the later poems dealing with women, more even-handed, sometimes good-humored, could be seen as a sane acceptance of the way things are. It would be possible to say that this was a kind of wisdom, a kind of maturity, that she came to understand that the ways of men and women are biologically determined. But that doesn't cut it in the case of a person like Levertov who refused to believe that a biological drive to violence in human was inevitable. And even if she believed that the situation were intractable, in her deeply held notion that the poet must be witness, did she not owe it to those who came after her to name the situation in its shadows, in its darkness, as she named the darkness and the shadows of the systems that she believed choked off the possibility of a fully lived life. 
I was astonished in reading the final paragraph of her autobiographical sketch. The conflicts that she alludes to lightly in the first sentence, the quote, domestic or other aspects of life, are quickly brushed aside. We know that in her own life, the demands of housekeeping and child rearing were a source of frustration for her, and it is no accident that 10 years between books of poems occur in the years when she has a young child. This is acknowledged only with the greatest obliquity in the work, and the only example she gives in the essay, Autobiographical Sketch, of what might keep the poet from writing are political. Quote, one is in despair over the current manifestation of malevolent imbecility and the seemingly invincible power of rapacity, yet finds oneself writing a poem about the trout lilies in the spring woods. And one has promised to speak at a meeting or help pick at a building. If one is conscientious, the only solution is to attempt to weigh conflicting claims at each crucial moment, and in general, to try to juggle well and keep all the oranges dancing in the air at once. But none of these oranges seems to be the orange of domestic responsibilities unfairly and disproportionately placed on a woman's shoulders. I can't help comparing this to an essay of Levertov's friend Ivan Boland, The Woman Poet and Her Dilemma, in which Boland speaks of the woman poet in the garden with her, quote, hot, small, and needy child whom she must keep from putting laburnum pods in her mouth for the 90th time. This, though, is the source of the mother's poetic inspiration. But she can't write a poem and turn her back on the child's possibility of sickening herself but via the ingestion of the inspiring laburnum. Of course, Bolin is of a generation younger than Levertov. But one could have wished that Levertov had learned from younger feminists what she was proud to have learned from younger anti-war activists. As is the case with her politics and her poetics, her sense of herself as a woman is folded into her religious understanding. But whereas she insists upon weaving her political and poetic des desires into the fabric of, her, fabric of her religious life, in relation to her sexuality, the religious imagination offers her only the possibility of renunciation. This may be tied to the problem of the place of women in the Catholic religious imagination, which gives pride of place to virginity and celibacy. There are almost no married female saints. Occasionally, they would dish up for our delectation someone like Francis of Rome or Jean-Francois de Chantal, but they were widows, no messy conjugality raising its problematic head. Levertov creates a strange fantasy romantic past for her beloved Julian of Norwich. Quote, she had not married, but was no starveling. If she had loved, she had been loved. Death or some other destiny bore him away. Death or some other bride changed him. Whatever that story, long since she had traveled through and beyond it. The other religious figure she invokes as inspiration is the courageous mother of God consenting freely at the Annunciation, but of course the mother of God is a virgin. In Levertov's final religious vision, there is no place for female sexuality. Unlike the threatened trees of in the woods, it cannot speak, quote, clearly beyond sound, that revolutionary presente. Levertov used outrage as a way of finding her true voice when it came to larger politics and poetics. She was sure of herself as a poet and activist, but insecure about herself as a desirable woman, afraid that if she unleashed her anger, she would render herself unlovable to men, a fear that was nowhere present in the challenging of, her, of other powers. I think this points to an intransigent problem in the lives of women, and one so deeply rooted that feminism has had only limited success in rooting it out. So I'm sympathetic to her sorrow, and yes, I'm disappointed. But is it a deal breaker? No. I don't want a life without Levertov's poetry, 
It's too important to me. When I take my daily swims in the summer, I pray to her using the words of the avowal. The Agnes Dei, primary wonder, the love of mourning, the servant girl Emmaus of being, the flickering mind, nothing else has helped me come to such a full understanding of the juggling act of being an artist who is, as she says, in faith. No, I hold onto the slippery garment she wears during our imagined encounters as she held in suspended onto the slippery garment of God, hoping that we will meet free of outrages, agreeing on everything in a vast unfolding design lit by a rising sun. This is not to answer any of the questions that you've raised, but it, it brought to my mind again, there are some lines in some of her journals, and she's about 50 at this point, and she says, I am really green. Um, I'm, you know, I'm under, undeveloped. And um, I think that's true, that for all of her insight, into so many areas about herself. She was just immensely opaque. She could not really see herself and these, what we would say, contradictions. And so it's just another conundrum. How, how was that possible, this woman of such attention, not see herself? Maybe it's telling us something about us, you know. <laughs> and our inabilities to see ourselves at the deepest level. But I think there was some maybe wound there that she couldn't touch. And I'm not sure it was ever resolved. And I think that's why another reason she's so valuable to us. She's no better than we are. <laughs> and, uh, and, and to think that this woman who wrote such great work is a mess like the rest of us. I, I think of Auden saying, have pity on us, uh, have pity on all writers, at the grave of Henry James, have pity on all writers whose life is, whose work is in better taste than their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it's, it's one reason why she's so moving and so poignant, and it actually makes the work valuable in another, in another way. Um, oh, you're, you're talking about her, her inability to, to face up to the situation of women in, sex, in a sexist society and so on. Made me, th made me, made me flash back to Duncan in, in their confrontation over political poetry. Duncan, Duncan says in a letter and then repeats in an in, interview. In, that what she thinks of as political outrage is really is really repressed uh, repressed anger against men, uh, and and she quite she she responds and says, you know, not it at all in a letter. Yeah. Yeah. And then and when he, he publishes that that uh, that. He allows the interview, to, uh, excerpts of the interview, to be published. She says he must take it back, and back, yeah. or, or we have nowhere to go, go uh, from here. 
And I understand her anger at, at Duncan, and I think I, 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 I think she, she was right in laying it out. Yes. But, but, it, but it's interesting that, that he goes right to that. To that, to that. Well, but it's a kind of man who basically says, you know, everything is about having a vagina. Um, and uh, the, actually, he wouldn't credit her with an abstract anger that wasn't rooted in the lived life because she was a woman and, you know, we know how we all think. Um, but I think that there's more than enough anger to go around. I mean, you can, you can be angry at, uh, 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 you can be angry at, at capitalism and, and the military industrial establishment and still have enough room to be mad at sexism too. Yeah. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And Adrienne Rich kind of proved that. Nominology of anger, is it? Yeah. I just wanted to add something to what Al was saying because um, I remember, I think it's in my biography, but I'm not sure, um, Adrienne Rich, um, either she told me or it's in, or she wrote to Levertov. Um, when Levertov introduced Duncan to her, um, Adrienne Rich was comparing herself in her mind to this poet who had nothing to do but write poetry, and she had these little kids around. And Adrienne Rich could acknowledge that. Denise couldn't. You know, there's a big difference. We have to end it right now. Another round of applause.